Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Raydun Dallan and I'm the Marketing Manager here at Andra. Today we are presenting the webinar Get to Know My Peg X Session 2, presented up by Mr. Harold Goldstein. Just some practical information before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. I'll bring them up during our Q&A session after the presentation. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Mr. Harold Goldstein, our presenter today, has worked with lifting applications since 1981, most of his time with the MyPEC products, starting off as a development engineer. The first system developed was the MyPEC 2 system. He moved on to sales in the early 90s and is today involved in sales, product management and business development of Crane products at Andra Data Instruments. Harold? Thank you, Raiden. Um, today we are going through the session two, which we have called the enhanced operation. And I'm uh, pleased to see that so many of you have also joined this uh, session two. And I'm also very um, um, pleased to see that many others has also looked at listen to our recorded version of session one. Obviously this session two will also be recorded and uh, you will get the link which I hope you will also distribute to colleagues which couldn't make the time today to see and listen in to this enhanced operation. We are follow, uh, covering the following topics today. Uh, which includes the SLU operation limit system, which we also used to call the OLM in the old days. We're going to look at how we can add and remove what we call or define as no-go zones, and how we can set up a crane operational map. We will look at afterwards the hook position system, uh, which we used to call the RSI, and we will uh, show how we can set up A to B, so-called overhoist limits, and the other extreme, the rope end limits. Connected to an AOPS system, we are also defining or generating what we call a boat zone. We'll also look into this. And then finally, you will see one of the changes it's many changes, but one of them is using a USB memory stick on the MyFig X instead of an additional laptop, cable, uh, and converter on the MyFig 2000 system. So we'll see how we can use the USB to download the crane operation recorder, download calibration data and configuration settings, and the opposite way to upload calibration data and configuration settings, and even upload operational and maintenance manuals and new software. So all of this later on. Starting with the SLU operation limit system, the no-go zone system, this involves fitting an encoder to your SLU gear, SLU motor on the crane. With this encoder and new software, we'll go through the steps of setting up an encoder logic in the system. First of all, as we looked at in session one, we have to go offline. Going offline, we enter into an operation limit OLM submenu. So when we hit that push button, we will go into two options the OLM general setup and the OLM sector setup. We will now go into the general setup, which is something which we do only once. It's setting up the logic in the system, reading the encoder the correct way. So going into the general setup, you will have a setup menu. First thing, you will do is then to actually slew the crane. If I slew the crane clockwise, I would expect 
the degrees of slew angle to increase. If that doesn't work, if it actually decreases, it's something wrong with the rotation. We don't know if your or the encoder is installed one way or the other way. And obviously, if it's installed logically the opposite way, we can actually compensate for that by turning the logic signal by clicking onto the reverse rotation direction. And when it goes green, you've actually turned the logic rotation. So when you then slew and everything seems to be working okay, you have to define what we call zero degrees slew position. I tend to call it home. You need to define where home is. And speaking to crane drivers, they like to see zero degrees in the crane rest. So when the crane is sitting in the crane rest, this is where they are actually defined zero degrees or home. So positioning the crane in the boom rest, you can then hit the set slew zero position. And the logic will then read the output from the sensor in this position and use this as the zero degrees definition. If you then slew, and when you slew one turn, you expect to go back to zero degrees slew angle. So it should work from zero to 360 degrees and then start again from your defined zero position. If that's not the case, if you actually reach zero before or way after the physical zero point, it's something wrong with the gear ratio. You have to alter the gear ratio, and we've done that very simple. You can only just count the teeth on the slew gear on the crane, the number of teeth there, and the number of teeth on the encoder disc. So if that's 20 on the crane and 10 on the disc, you actually have a ratio of two to one. Obviously that's just a random number. Uh, your number is to be counted. And you can change that by using the pop-up keyboard, entering the correct uh, gear ratio. When this is done, you actually sort of told the system which rotation you're slewing, where home is and the gear ratio. And you're ready to go into what we call an OLM sector setup. So from the same menu, now click on to the setup sector menu, and you will get another um, sub-menu. This sub-menu is used to define no-go zones. And you can use the crane again to define a no-go zone. You can slew to the no-go area. If I look down the crane boom, I'm now stopping the crane where I want the signal to pre-warn or to actually uh, trip a relay. If you look at the no-go area, this is actually the left corner of my no-go limit. So sector left is one definition. And if I then slew to this uh, corner, and now click on to the read button, the sector left position will automatically by, be read by the computer. In this case, it's 50 degrees slew angle. I can repeat this by going to the right corner of the no-go area and in this position click on to the button again called read sector right and it will update and say in this case 106 degrees. I can then boom up. If I have something above the crane, that could be the helideck. It could be other structure, which inhibits me from booming to minimum radius. Um, I can boom to where I want the sector boom high angle. 
Again, in this position, I click on to read and the sector boom high angle 75.2 in this example will be entered and loaded into the computer. And then the final one is if you boom down and you have to stop before you hit something booming down, again, you will hit read sector boom low, in this case, 32.9 degrees. All these four values, left, right, high, and low, which defines a sector, can also be entered by using a pop-up keyboard if you have those documented, previous calibration, or if it's from a drawing. So one no-go zone is defined by four angles, two slew angles and two boom angles. But as you may notice, we also have a fifth parameter, which is the sector load limit, which means that sectors can be valid only if a load is above a certain value. In this case, it will be valid for all uh, crane operations, but you can enter, for instance, a four ton, and it's only valid if the load picked up by the hook is above four tons. When you've done, you press the save sector. Save sector will also show you the sector which you just generated by, in this case, light blue, which is then indicated as the no-go sector, both below the angle and above the angle. If I go online, you will also see the boom. The yellow is the boom, as we looked at in uh, sector one, uh, in session one. Uh, and when you slew or boom up and down, you will see the position of the boom tip working inside this corridor or approaching a no-go sector. And of, of course, you can have several sectors. You can have up to 10 sectors in the standard system. In this case, the number of sectors is three. Sector one, sector two, and sector three. And they are all identified or counted in the clockwise sequence. So this is the first one, this is the second one, and this is the third one. This element shows that I'm now looking at sector number two. And if I want to alter or configure something around number two, I can add the sector to the left of number two, which would be in this area. I can add something to the right of the sector, which would be in this area, and I can remove the sector altogether. I'm now looking at sector number two. Sector number two out of the total of three. If I now, for instance, want to remove the sector, again, I'm looking at sector number two. And when I now click on to remove sector, you will see from the map that this sector is now, has now disappeared. The total is now two because I deleted one and I'm looking at sector two, so I'm looking at this and I have the system has automatically renumbered them. So this is again number one and this is two. And now it's only two in total. Section number three. So while you uh, look at number three, I'll have a sip of uh, water. It's a well deserved, Harold. Thank you. We'll go to the hook position system, which uh, also sets up the A to B, the anti two block position, the rope end, and together with the OLM defines a boat zone. Going offline, 
we just looked at the operation limit. We will now go, in, go to rope speed parameters RSI or maybe more precise, the hook position. Operating the push button will go into the RSI setup. And in this case, the setup is more comprehensive than the OLM. But again, this is only done once. When done, you can forget about it. All these numbers has to do with defining the winch, the rope and the setup values. Looking closer to them, it means as the OLM, if you operate the winch hoisting, you expect the winch to move in one direction and the payout to be decreasing. If it's increasing, it's something wrong with the rotation direction. Again, we don't know how the sensor is fitted to this particular crane. If it operates in the incorrect direction, you're able to tick the box. When it goes green, you know that you logically have turned the sensor. Again, you can also change the gear ratio as on the OLM. We don't know how much rope you've got on the rope but we know that you are paying out rope from the top layer. So we will ask you to measure the diameter of the top layer, the layer which you pay out rope. In this case, in millimeters, 318, which is the diameter uh, where you pay out rope. We also would like to know the size of the rope or the cable. If it's a three quarter, 20 millimeter, one inch, whatever, the size of the rope has to be entered. And if you want to compensate for the dead weight of the rope, you're actually able to do that now by adding the dead weight of the rope into this box. As you pay out rope or hoist up rope, you will change layers. So we would like to know how many turns, wraps or whatever you would call it, is on the top layer. You measured the diameter being a 318 and it's five turns in the top layer. The next layer is now 26. So when we turn out five wraps, we know that we've changed to the next layer. And the system will calculate the new um, diameter because we know the rope diameter. Again, this is all mathematics. You don't really need to know it, but we need to know the numbers and the computer will calculate the rest for you. Then we have a question mark, which means if you press the question mark, you will have a sketch. This sketch is also shown in the operating and maintenance manual as all other information which I have now gone through. It means if the winch, the load hoist winch is inside the boom, you can forget about the X and the Y, uh, the horizontal and the vertical offset. But if the winch, as many cranes has, is offset from the boom, or rather whether rope leaves the stationary side of the crane. I haven't seen a crane with a, a sheave up there, but just to illustrate, it's not necessarily the winch, it's where the rope leaves the stationary side of the crane. We need to know the X and the Y value. And this is to compensate from the effect when you boom down, and you are able to boom into tube blocking. So, I will now set the two block, the A2 block, which means I will hoist the block to where I want the crane to stop. 
to avoid over hoisting, avoid that the block can be pulled into the structure of the crane. In this position, you just press the set A to B, which is the reference point. This position will now be memorized, and when you exceed this limit, you will have alarms, bells, and rel relay kickouts from the system. The same thing happens for the rope end pre-warning or final limit. You pay out the rope to the rope end or where you want the crane to stop from lowering or paying out rope. And again, you hit the reed at the warning limit and you hit the reed when you uh, go to the limit where you want the cranes to stop. So the hook position system has the same display, but it's a lot of information on that display. The top one says paid out. When you do the A2 block setting, this distance is zero. This is the paid out distance below the boom tip. The display has also a small gauge showing the actual speed and if you're hoisting or lowering. If you hoist and you come to the approach A to B, you will have a pre-warning. This is very often tied into a buzzer, but you will also have a visual yellow indication that you now approach the A to B position. In this case, it's set to be a 0.6 meter below the A2 limit. If you continue to hoist, you will get into alarm red and a kick out with an alarm saying that you now exceeded the limit, which is called the A to B limit stopping you, if connected to a relay, from hoisting further. This bar graph shows the position of the hook above the hinge pin, the boom pivot. So if the hook is above the boom pivot, it's on the positive side. And if it's uh, below, it's on the negative side. So with the hook just in front of you at the heel pin, it is reading zero. So hook position in this case is 11.2 meters above the hinge pin. In this case, I have lowered the hook by paying out rope to negative 28 meters. And I've now reached a yellow alarm which is a symbol of the winch, and you will get approach minimum wrap with a pre-warning. If I continue to pay out rope, now paid out 32.4, I will hit the limit, a red alarm, and a kick out relay, uh, saying that you now reach the limit. The hook position is now negative 30.1 meter below the hinge pin reference. I have another reference there, which in all these examples are equal to the hook position. If I work blind, meaning if I lower the hook behind the building or I can't have a visual contact with the load, I can hit the zero. And this will go zero and I will know relative distance below my reference point. So this is below the hinge pin, this is below my own reference point. This is not connected into any limits. It's just sort of a, um, a memory mark, so to say. 
in the North Sea and many other parts of the world, um, we have the requirement of connecting a system in to an automatic overload protection system, an AOPS. We also have MOPS, which is a, um, another level, uh, a lower level, uh, which is a manual overload protection system. I will talk about the AOPS uh, for a few minutes. The AOPS is, in our version, connected to Three, at least three elements. It's nothing on the rig platform vessel which is heavy enough to cre create an AOPS signal, meaning you will not be able to lift anything which is above typically 150% of safe working load, which is an AOPS level. The only thing which is, could be that heavy is the supply boat. And obviously, you're not trying to lift the supply boat, but you can be connected to the su supply the boat by accident, either directly that the crane hook is hooked into the uh, boat, or it's hooked to a container which is still bolted down to the boat, or the uh, container is locked by other um, containers and elements on the boat. So we try to combine the safe load indicator output, which is the load, with a SLU operation monitor, because the boat has to be over the side of the rig. So the crane is now facing the sea. We're not working into a moon pool. We're not working into a shaft. We are facing the sea. Then we also add the hook position element into it, which means the hook has to be approaching the boat. It has to be below your cellar deck. And you define where you want this AOPS to be armed, meaning it will only work when the boom is over the side and the hook is below your defined hook position. Then it's armed. It will work if the crane sees a load above the AOPS limit and the operator has confirmed that he's working the C by selecting C duty. It will now release the signal or give a signal to the winch and in this hook position setup you can define the hook height negative 25 meters means it's 25 meters below my boom hinge pin again you press this window and a pop-up keyboard allows you to set up whatever um, uh, distance you want. This could actually also be a positive value, but in most respect, uh, it's a negative because you're working a boat which is way lower than the, the crane operator. So another sip of water. <laughs> Looking at the list of uh, people attending this uh, session too, I know that uh, almost all of you have um, fairly well knowledge about the MIPIC 2000 system. One of the points which always had sort of a, a bad taste on the MIPIC 2000 was the requirements of adding a laptop, climb that ladder with the laptop, with a finding a connection cable, a USB conversion cable to do both calibration, downloading um, core data. So we have changed that dramatically. Today, 
we are using a memory stick in many ways. A typical picture of a MyPEG X in a crane cabin. Below the display, hidden or protected by a cap, we have a USB a memory stick. Every system will have a memory stick installed. We are now going through how to download the Crane Operation Recorder, the COR. The system stores approximately 5,000 records. And to download it into the memory stick, we go offline into the core menu. And the core menu will show the percent of core used. This will also be displayed if activated on the screen itself. Then the first thing you have to do is to upload the core from the master three card. Remember, although the USB sits in the display, the memory is on the master three card. The display has no logic as such. It, it has to get the information from the master three card. So upload core is the first thing. You will also see that you can view the last core which you transferred, which also means that the display has a backup, um, a backup of the last uploading. When you hit upload core, it will show you how long time it takes and that it actually is moving. So it shows you upload progress. And when it's done, it will ask you to view the recorded data by pressing the view record. And on the 15 inch screen, we will dump the information. And the purpose is for you to sort of view that it looks correct, not to analyze it on the screen, but just to see that everything works okay. It looks okay. Next step, after confirming that the data is uploaded okay, is to copy it onto the USB. And of course, if somebody took the USB, um, it will abort because it will see that the USB is not found. But hopefully in most cases, the USB will be there and you are able to download it. And when it's downloaded, you are able to clear the core in the master three card. But remember, you actually have a backup and you are able to go back if you're out of synchronization. So downloading is done much simpler using the USB. Calibration data is also backed up quite differently. MyPIC 2000, you were able to do a download of the calibration data. In this case, on the MyPIG X, you can also do a download of calibration data. Remember again, the logic, the vital information is on the master three card. Now this is a picture of a portion of the MyPIG master three card, and this is the USP port. So you can install the uh, memory stick into this USB port, and you are ready to do a full backup of calibration. When you hit write calibration and set up to the USB, you not only do the calibration, but you will do a download of all limits, all settings, and you will generate a unique calibration file. So the 2000, you were doing download the calibration. On the X, you take all the parameters uh, which is um, unique for the for the system, which also means if you are have this on record, you can put those into a USB, 
and you can read the calibration from the USB uploading it into the system. Something which was not available on the 2004. Then you have to manually enter all the information by typing in it, which you still can, but you not now also have the possibility of using the USB. So it's, it is definitely enhanced also in this respect. If you want to or have to change the program, or if you have a basic system and you want to add features like getting a new sensor, you want to have a slew operation monitoring or hook position, of course you can do that. The new software will be done, tested by my peg here in Bergen. We will send it to you on an email. You will be able to load it onto USB and you're able to then upload the information. Of course, you would need the sensor, etc., uh, etc. Et then you can upload and execute this by doing a reload of the new configuration. And that's it, guys. Thank you for joining our session two. Um, the recorded version will be made available for all of uh, you who uh, has uh, registered for this session. And uh, I don't know if we have any questions, and I'll try to answer them, Raiden. Yes, thank you, Harold. Very interesting. Um, yes, we will go ahead and take some time for questions now. Um, just a reminder to everyone that still have a few uh, questions, uh, go ahead and type them into the control panel. Um, we have ha we still have some questions, yes, some have been very eager and it's great to, to see uh, all the questions that have come in. Um, first one here is, um, are you able to generate a sector where you can work behind a no-go area? Um. That's a quite a, a delicate question. Um, no, uh, we we have decided not to go there because if you are working behind one no-go area, you have to sort of add information about the load itself, the size of the load, the length of the load, uh, and then this will change from every operation to the next so it will be become very little flexible uh, flexibility in the system so we decided not to have a sort of a, a mid section and you are able to work behind it so the answer is no okay thank you harold um there's one question here um fairly long one i'll okay. i'll do it slowly <laughs> We know that the MyPEG 2000 load and angle sensors are directly compatible with MyPEG X. Is the computing power contained within the display or is there still an external computer enclosure? Uh, we have an external computer uh, enclosure. Um, the setup is pretty much like the 2000. We have a display which is you can swap a display between cranes. The display is controlled uh, by a computer cabinet, which is, can be stored anywhere in theory, but it is still a computer cabinet and a display, same as the 2000. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one is, what is the maximum number of SLU restriction zones that can be set up? What we have in uh, the system today is 10. Um, I know our R&D people would, uh, don't like me saying that we can do more, but uh, <laughs> so far we haven't seen the need for more than 10. Okay, another one here. Uh, will an AOPS output release the load? Uh, it's a, it, maybe I've 
said release, but uh, in the reality, um, an AOPS signal will lift or will be a signal which is supposed to lift the brakes off the winch. The winch should be back tensioned to a certain amount, so it will be a controlled lowering of the load. It's not like a free fall. Uh, it should be back tensioned typically by safe working load of the crane. We can also provide an analog signal, which then provides uh, a 4 to 20, 0 to 10 volt signal to back tension the crane according to safe working load. So no, it's not a free fall. It's a signal lifting the brakes off the winch. Okay, thank you, Harold. Uh, another one here is, um, is, there an, is there an approach to slew to slew restriction zone? Yes, uh, it is. Maybe I went too uh, fast through that, but um, if you go into the recorded version, set the, up the slew angle system, you had margins for slew, you have margins for uh, minimum and maximum uh, angle. So it will come up with a pre-warning uh, before the final clockwise, counterclockwise, high or low. And that margin uh, can be altered by yourself, but it will be the same margin for all sectors. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a data logging for SLU restriction zones, A to B and rope and we do a data logging of um, the pickup slew angle and the set down slew angle. Um, we have so far not programmed um, the evidence that you actually sort of uh, approach the limit or for that reason pass the slew angle A to B or whatever, but that should be doable without too much of a problem because the limits are detected and therefore it could easily be programmed to be recorded. Okay, thank you. There's very many interesting questions coming in. Okay. Um, and uh, here's one. Um, the MyPEG X is totally new. However, however does not keep records for more than 5,000 records. This approach is the same as the MyPEG 2000 system. Why not increase? Yeah, both of the 2000 and the X, the 5000 number uh, was a limitation which we did uh, in the software. Because although you have two versions, you have the FIFO first in, first out, which will overwrite itself most of our users will use this as planned maintenance input. And since it's planned maintenance input, we want to, in brackets, force the user to download and look at the data. If the number is, instead of 5,000, 50,000, we know that people would sort of sit on the records for years and years, not analyzing it. We would like to, as I said, force them to look at it uh, because this is evident of the crane's usage. Maybe some of the inspection has to be put forward, do it earlier. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can MyPEG X be operated for 24 7? MyPEG X is designed to be 24 7, and we would recommend that it's powered all the time. Okay. Um, is setup pages password protected? Can it be recorded when this service page is ac accessed and who accessed it, the setup page? Normally the end user would, through the administrator password, set up access codes and they will keep track of uh, their own access codes. We can record the number uh, of um, which code which has been used for, for different uh, uh, options. Um, but we, uh, we will only record a number and uh, end user has to self uh, do the sort of bookkeeping 
to find out who is number one, two, three. But um, as in, in theory, yes, we can do that. We haven't done it uh, currently. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of more. We'll make time for that. Uh, could a MyPEG 2000 display be swapped out directly by a MyPEG X display, or is the Master 3 card different? Um, as I probably said last time, but I can repeat that. Uh, we use the same boom angle, uh, load hoist sensors being the main and the aux, but the computer and the display is totally new. The Master 2 card cannot uh, support or drive or whatever the right English word is, um, cannot uh, control the uh, MyPEG X display. So it's a new computer and it's a new display. Saying a new computer, you can still keep all the field cabling, you can keep everything else we will swap out uh, the contents in the box, the same size. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll jump to the final question of today and um, the others we will have to um, get back to after the webinar. Uh, can USB be left on the port when the MyPEG X is operational? Yes, uh, that is sort of a, probably the, the right place to have it because I can guarantee you if you are like me and most people are like me when it comes to USB you never know where they are so <laughs> keep them in there uh, that's the purpose of it so you remove it to download uh, the information or transfer it onto the server and then hope people will put them back in there otherwise you will lose track of where they are so yes, you can operate it with them in the port. Okay, with that, I think we're gonna wrap up and say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Today, we appreciate you being here. And Harold, anything you would like to say as a final note? No, just joining your uh, sort of um, thank you to everybody. Uh, as um, Raiden said, uh, it's a few other questions. We, knew, we know who uh, raised them and we will answer them uh, later on. Again, as I said on session one, it's a recorded version. We know that uh, some areas of the world, this is very late at evening night. Please distribute it to your colleagues. Um, uh, hopefully it's uh, information there which is uh, valid as the number of X system is growing and growing fast out there. So uh, great doing this uh, two sessions. Hope uh, we can uh, sort of do this also in the future, but we will no doubt meet in person also. So take care, my friends. Thank you. Bye-bye.